So I want to thank you all and uh, for coming and welcome you to the to March's virtual astronomy software talks. We have uh, we're we're recording the session today, as you've heard, and we'll, we will add the video to the vast YouTube channel um, later this week. Our first presentation is on prose, and. I'm getting a reminder about this session. Nice. <laughs> and is presented by Lionel Garcia, who is a PhD student in the astrobiology department at the University of Liège in Belgium. Uh, he's the main author of Prose, which provides modular image processing pipelines for astronomy. So Lionel, if you'd like to go ahead and um, share your screen and start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should be working. Okay, great. So hi everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. It's really a pleasure to be uh, presenting pros uh, in these really nice seminars. Uh, so my name is uh, Lionel Garcia. I'm from the University of Liège in Belgium, and um, I go right away with what pros is. So pros is a Python package first to build modular image processing pipelines, and it is meant for astronomy. And before going into uh, what PROS can do, what it's doing, uh, we wanted first to, um, to address the question, what was our motivation uh, when we decided to go and develop something from scratch to do this kind of reductions processing, right? So what we wanted first is something really open source and readable. So I'm in a team when sometime we have uh, images from different instruments and we will receive from uh, colleagues scripts, in, whether in Python or something else, uh, that are really long. It's usually one script or a folder and really hard to understand. So you will have to read everything. There is no comments, no documentation. And when trying to uh, build something from scratch, we really wanted to first have something open source, of course, but also extremely readable. So it should be that if I send uh, to my colleagues uh, a script with a pipeline, a uh, reduction uh, sequence or whatever, uh, they should understand what the script is doing just by reading it, uh, hence the name pros. Then we wanted something completely modular because we are doing really different things with uh, images. Uh, we might do uh, instrument commissioning when we want something really um, quick to do some alignment, to, do, uh, to estimate the backgrounds kind of things. Uh, or we might do science, doing uh, aperture photometry, PSF photometry to characterize uh, the PSF of an image, uh, many different things. So really we wanted to be able to reuse whatever blocks we will be using uh, between these different applications. And also to have our colleagues being able to reuse these blocks, right? If you need to, need to, to detect stars, uh, you want this detection to be available, whatever you're doing. Then we wanted to, uh, in some, something in Python, um, simply because of the growing interest uh, of the community in Python. Also in my team, we're working with, uh, I mean, some people used to work with IRAF, uh, IRF is not maintained anymore, so this was another reason. And also, we really wanted something portable, so anyone should just do pip install and, and have uh, something ready to work with. And finally, something laptop fast. And what I mean by laptop fast is we understand that if people have to wait one, two days to have some data reduced, they might not be uh, extremely keen in uh, optimizing their pipelines, right? Whereas if you really can just tweak the parameter of your pipelines, uh, make uh, trials really fast, uh, you can iterate and optimize your pipeline towards the, the best scientific products. So we really wanted something that runs on a PC um, or laptop, uh, whatever uh, material you have. So what, what we ended up with, with this kind of requirements, uh, is an object-oriented structure to build modular pipelines in, Pipeta, in Python. And the main object, of course, uh, behind this structure is an image, right? It contains some data and some metadata, and this is quite, uh, I mean, something you will find for fits images. And what you want to do sometimes is also to analyze a series of images, whereas you're doing um, broadband uh, filter observation. So you have if images are in different uh, filters, or you want to do a time series from all your images, this kind of things. You, you might even want um, to combine images from different instruments. So that's another case. And on these images, you want to do several things. Uh, first things are calibration type of things, alignment, uh, proper calibration, again, bias, darks. Uh, you might want to do some analysis, detect the sources, of course, aperture photometry, PSF photometry, 
uh, estimate the background, you want to count the galaxies to find planet nine, uh, uh, moving object detections, maybe something you want to do. And then you want to either be able to save your results somewhere uh, in images or make a video, for example, uh, of, of a time series if you have different uh, several images, or you want to access uh, the results directly in Python, in your Python instance, whereas it is in a, an empire a dictionary or something. So to do all these tasks, you see here, what we developed is a library of blocks. Uh, a block we call uh, is a single processing unit, and each of the blocks that are available in pros, and you can develop your own, um, do something specific. They take an image in, and they output an image, and the image we carry the information. Let's say you want a block to uh, characterize the PSF of your image. You need some sources. So first, you, you should use a block that detects the sources. That's the ID uh, behind it. And what you will do is really to assemble these blocks into sequences, basically pipelines, and run these sequences on uh, images. So images go sequentially into the sequence. The advantage of um, this architecture is really to have the blocks developed independently, uh, also blocks being cross-compatible, then to have the blocks tested independently, that's important, and also documented independently. So if I give you a script of a sequence, you have uh, the documentation of pros, you, you should be able by design to uh, understand what the sequence is doing and the sequence should be quite concise. So here is an example, quite simple example of uh, pros in action in Python. So first line is about importing uh, objects. Then you have a, a loading of a fits image, right? This is this image equal something line. And then we define a sequence. What the sequence is doing is to characterize the effective uh, point spread function of the image. It consists on, uh, in uh, four blocks here. So the first is to detect sources. Then we make small cutouts around these sources. We build an effective PSF by stacking. And then we model this PSF uh, here through a Moffat 2D profile. So that's it. With this sequence, you should be able to do this, to send this sequence to a colleague, and even to apply the sequence to any image from any instrument. And that's also, it was also an idea we, we had from the beginning that whatever sequence you're producing should be uh, applied to whatever image. And the job of converting the fits file to something, uh, an object workable uh, in prose, it's just about a loader. So you see this fits image loader. And actually, this one can accommodate for a lot of uh, different telescopes. I will talk about it later. This is another example, a bit more complex. There is two sequences. So you have a first sequence for uh, calibration. This is done in a reference image. And once you execute it, you can apply it to a lot of different images, so a time series of images. And here is really to do the photometry, a part of photometry uh, of uh, a field being observed. Here, uh, it is to produce a light curve of a transiting exoplanet. So I will not go into the details, but this is just to show you how concise you can make the pipelines and how readable it should be for someone that uh, have a knowledge of the process uh, of aperture photometry and what it involves, uh, or even just know what uh, you intend to do. So uh, on top of that, you uh, we provide some additional tools that are extremely useful when you deal with um, observations, uh, especially when you deal with uh, fits image. So the first of these tools is a fits manager. It happens a lot that you receive the images in folders, and um, the only um, clue you have on these images mostly is in the name. And you really want to avoid to start opening every image to know what is the source, or what is the object you are observing, from which telescope it is, from in date, filter, whatever. So we have this tool, Fits Manager, to really parse fits in folders and subfolders, and it has a lot of uh, nice capabilities. For example, you could specify uh, that you want all um, calibration files from uh, observation ID3, and it will retrieve the closest calibration from the same telescope. You can have some uh, filtering of the exposure time, filter uh, size of the images, this kind of thing. So really convenient. On the background, uh, the back end is uh, an SQL database. You don't need to know uh, SQL uh, language to uh, manipulate the, the data. Uh, you can do it through Pandas. Uh, but still, it allows really powerful things. For example, here, uh, we have a small server, and it's uh, it's managed by this Fits Manager with more than 3 uh, million images. So really something robust. Then we have a telescope object. So this is really to enable one sequence to run on different kinds of images from different telescopes. And this, um, uh, simply put, is really just a dictionary, a dictionary to translate Fit headers keywords into what you expect uh, in your image object. For example, you will specify 
some things that vary. Sometimes it should not, but it varies. Uh, the units for the right ascension uh, that is defined in your in your header. So these kind of things that we want to record. Once you um, uh, define the telescope, you instantiate the telescope. It is automatically saved, so you can reuse it, and it is recognized by pros pipelines. Uh, so you can reuse it uh, over different uh, applications. So I mentioned the, uh, that we wanted pros to be fast on laptop, and basically a lot of methods exist for detection and so on that are quite fast. But we had some uh, things that we wanted to improve to make it really faster and available on laptops. One of these things is doing alignment. Uh, if you know this service, astrometry.net, it enables you from a picture of the sky to have uh, the world coordinate system associated to it, uh, but it takes quite some time. So if you will do the request uh, on, on the server, uh, you will really wait for uh, a, lot, a lot of time. If, for example, you have a thousand uh, time series images. So what we wanted is to re-implement the algorithm behind astrometry.net knowing that most of the time astronomers know more or less what are in the sky in terms of right ascension declination. So we developed Twirl. It's the same algorithm, but instead of querying the whole sky, we make a small Gaia query and it goes much faster. So this really enabled to make alignment uh, easily and uh, in a quick way, which was not available before. Another block we developed is one uh, based on a technique called ballet uh, about central heading. So most of the time, especially if you do have virtual photometry, you really want to uh, locate the centroid of your sources. And there is a trade of doing that. Uh, you want accuracy, but also you want it to be fast. In our case, we want both things. And so we developed a neural network to uh, locate the centroid in a really precise way, as accurately as uh, you would uh, do with the 2D Gaussian model, but two uh, orders of magnitudes faster. So this really allowed to make fast centroiding uh, on a lot of images uh, you have to process. And this was in inspired by why uh, what people are doing, uh, measuring cosmic shear, especially the paper from Herbal 2018. So these two blocks are integrated to pros and they really enable things to go a bit faster when sometime you would have some uh, drawback from using this. So let's make a quick tour of the blocks uh, that are available. Uh, this is directly from the documentation of pros. You have some blocks for detection. Uh, you might recognize here that we're using Fortitus, uh, implementation of uh, dao -Fot detection. And by the way, Fortitus is uh, one of the major dependencies of pros. We have blocks to do uh, PSF characterization. Uh, here you see a lot of modeling uh, tools uh, on different kind of profiles. And by the way, uh, more and more we're trying to integrate uh, the use of JAX, which is a high performance machine learning library. So really being able to do this kind of modeling in a fast way. Then we have some tools for alignment. Uh, I described Twirl. Twirl is quite used in all of these blocks, for example, to align uh, sources to a reference in all your images or even to do plate solving only from an image. It goes really fast. Then some tools for centroiding. So these are the blocks of centroiding. Mo most of them are uh, directly taken from implementation of uh, InfoTutus, but we have the ballet ones that I just described. Then photometry, a part of photometry. PSF photometry is not there yet, but uh, we have the plan to, to, uh, to have it available. And then some utilities. I will directly go uh, to the application so you can see the uh, kind of thing we do with pros, uh, especially in terms of, uh, the, let's say, um, useful blocks uh, that we, we integrated. So here, just a reminder that pros is really for image processing. After the image processing part, all the science is really up to the people taking the products from whatever pipeline they develop. So whatever we will be presenting here, it's uh, only the exploitation of these products and where uh, this product has been produced by a uh, pipeline developed with pros. So there have been applications to study binaries, study comets, uh, also reduce uh, spectroscopic images, long six spectroscopy. We have a project for occultation light curves. Uh, there is a project with uh, ESO and the company to do satellite pollution monitoring. So processing the images to detect satellites and, uh, and update uh, the, the ephemerates. And more and more, we want to also uh, allow for um, uh, extragalactic objects to be observed. So this is one uh, nice application. This is the occultation Laika, full occultation of a star by this small body called Yaka, which is the moon of uh, the dwarf planet Omea. So that's a lot of bodies. But anyway, this is a star occulted by uh, a moon. And you can see this full occultation. This sequence uh, is made of nine blocks. And what is nice is that one of these blocks, the last one, is called the video plot. Uh, it takes a function as input. This function takes an image. It just plots something. And... Uh, for free, uh, you put that in your sequence and you have a GIF or a video of your night. So here is what it's really nice also to do some diagnostics uh, on top of your reductions and 
and pipelines. Another application was to uh, retrieve the transition spectra of TRAPPIST-1H. So this is the outermost planet of uh, a really nice exoplanetary system. Uh, this has been done in collaboration with Gillian David. So here, uh, it was a nice application because we just read a description of a pipeline in the literature, and we went on and developed some basic blocks to reproduce it uh, quite nicely. I will mention other works. Uh, one of Mathilde Timmermans is using PROS to uh, make a follow-up from the ground of uh, the test exoplanets candidates. So there are a lot of need uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this field, and uh, it really enables her to do this automatically, uh, whereas she will have trouble using, for example, a graphic visual interface, as many people do. Finally, another project really interesting. This is uh, about the development of a reduction pipeline on-site in Antarctica for the ASTEP telescope, um, a telescope uh, which is searching for transiting exoplanets again. And uh, here it was interesting because we had to think about what kind of products we want in and out. We have a really low bandwidth. So even a Git uh, pool, it's really uh, not some, something you don't want to do there. Uh, it's too much data. So uh, it was really an interesting experience also to have pros uh, made robust, to really be able to rely on pros on this remote location. So where are we right now in the development of PROS? I will check the time. You, you have five minutes. Perfect. So PROS is a really young project, despite the, the number of the version. Right now we are at version three. And what we want with version three is really to do a community development. So it has been developed quite locally uh, with people around me, but we really want to port that and to, uh, let's say, open the development to the community. So we are on GitHub and we want to have uh, developers joining the, the project. We have uh, a strategy which is to uh, find people in their own fields that want to use pros, and we support the development of blocks through these people. So these people will develop blocks. And what we make is we try to make these people interact one with the other, because the, the, the real goal here is to have blocks that should be uh, available and uh, useful for every field, right? Detection blocks, for example, you, you can use in any field. So this is our strategy to, to, to share these developments per field and to make these people communicate one with the other. I think I'm done. I, I want to leave actually time for questions. Uh, so I will just expose here some questions I have and I want to discuss, but of course I'm happy to answer any question. The first is uh, I heard a lot about um, user growth in these seminars. And I really have to, want to have your view, your experience on how to do that, also how to advertise uh, software in the uh, astronomy community. Another thing is uh, pros is meant for people that naturally will not go and develop something from scratch, meaning using lower level libraries like Fortitus, uh, AstroPy, even if it's not a lower level sometime. Uh, so this is really our target users, but these users not being developers, they might not want to uh, join the development of such a tool because they're not developers. So there is this question, how do you train uh, non-developers, astronomers sometimes that are bad at programming uh, into this kind of open source project on to embark people in the, in the development? And finally, I think a question that is quite important for me, a lot of people when I present pros ask if it is meant to replace IRAF, if it's the next IRAF. So first thing, IRAF is doing much more than pros. Pros really stops at the image processing part. Uh, so that's the first thing. So it's not IRAF, but it can be seen as a framework because we use a lot of lower level packages. And the question is, should we rather encourage users to use these lower level packages instead of providing something higher level that can be black boxed if you just don't read the documentation? So these are the kind of subjects I want to, to chat about. Anyway, uh, really happy to answer your questions. You can find pros on GitHub. Right now we had version three. It's not really yet, but it's really the version that will be the the, the most tested and the most developed in the uh, near future. So um, be free to go and check it out and ask questions if you have any. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Lionel. We have time um, to start with one of your questions. And uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with, with pros also. So one of the questions you want to ask people is how do you train um, people new to writing software? How do you get them on board. And I'm wondering if anybody wants to address that. Anybody in the, anybody listening want to start on that? I'm happy to comment, but maybe others might want the chance. But um, uh, what I would say, Lionel, is uh, that 
you should have um, in GitHub, you can have issues that are marked as, you know, needs help or something. It's one of the labels, default labels that GitHub provides. And it's meant to be a way that um, you can advertise easy projects for people to start coming on board with. Uh, other projects that we've heard about from here have had success with Google Summer of Code providing funding for, uh, for students to work over the summer and start to contribute to the project. And then, you know, just getting the word out. Once you, once you get users, users will want to do something. And, and the, the best thing you can do is be welcoming. So, you know, adopt a code of conduct in your project if you don't have one, just to make it clear that, that you are a welcoming project. And, you know, be patient with new users. Make sure that they know that, you know, any contribution, no matter how small, is welcomed because that's how they become more comfortable to build up larger and larger contributions. It's a process, but if people feel welcome, then they will stick around. Yes, great advice. It's true that making the effort of uh, making these nice um, uh, labels, uh, like uh, first good yeah. uh, contribution is something yeah. powerful. I will think about it. Yeah, so it might be helpful if you pose those three if you post those questions into the chat so people can um, have them so we can have them readily available in the discussion period. And that's oh, yeah. that's the timer. <laughs> so um, so thank you. Let's let's please have some applause for uh, let's see, I've got some applause here. Yes, yes, some applause for Lionel. Thank you so much for a lovely talk on a really great software package. Yeah, that was really impressive. It's yeah, a nice piece of yeah that's very cool. Um, next up is uh, Bjorn Emont, who is presenting on the Common Astronomy Software Applications Package, which is CASA. And uh, this is, he's the community, the user, the user community liaison for this project, and he's at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. So Bjorn, if you would please share your okay. screen. Hi, can you see this? Yes. Okay. And Great. then go. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you can hear me well. Um, so thanks again for inviting me and, and allowing me to give you a, an overview of the, the CASA software. Um, yes, I'm, I'm indeed working at NRAO and I'm the CASA user liaison. So I'm the intermediate between the, the user community and the CASA development team. Um, so CASA is the common astronomy software applications for radio astronomy. It's basically the primary data processing for the VLA and for ALMA, uh, but it's a very versatile software. So it's frequently used also for, for other radio telescopes. I'm giving you this, this presentation on behalf of the CASA team. Uh, as you can see, the CASA team is, is big. We have about 30 people working at NRAO, ESO and NAOJ. Uh, we also very closely work together with a team at Jive, uh, who works on CASA VLBI uh, functionality, and with the Algorithm Research and Development Group at, at NRAO. Um, also interesting to point out, we have quite a few stakeholders uh, who we work with, uh, in particular at ALMA, VLA, but also internally at NRAO, and of course the general users who are represented by the CASA Users Committee and, and also by myself. So in this talk, I will first tell you a little bit about the basics of interferometry. Uh, I will then give you an overview of the CASA software, uh, how to download CASA, um, documentation about CASA. And I will end this talk with a few minutes telling you something about CASA's next generation infrastructure. So when you talk about radio astronomy, um, one, of course, CASA, CASA is a software package that, that supports both single dish and interferometry telescopes. Um, I will focus on interferometry here. Uh, single dish telescopes, of course, um, are great, but at, 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 at the uh, sorry, at the wavelengths, the long wavelengths of radio astronomy, if you want to get high resolution, uh, you need a really big telescope, uh, often kilometers in size or, or hundreds of kilometers in size. And of course, you cannot make single dish telescopes like that. 
So we use the principle of interferometry. Basically, we break our telescopes up in, in individual antennas and we, we link them together. And uh, very simply said, this, uh, this principle is based on, on, on interference. So if you look at, a, for example, a point source in the sky uh, with two antennas, uh, you have this wavefront coming from the source and the wavefront arrives at one telescope a bit earlier than at the other one. So this is path length difference. So the wavefronts are, are either in phase or, or out of phase. And if you track the source across the sky, you can get this, this interference pattern that you see in the top right corner. Now, of course, a real telescope is a bit more complex. Uh, if you look in the right-hand side, once you start adding dishes, you'll so you have superpositions of these interference patterns. You kind of start building up your, what we call the point spread function or the, the synthesized beam. If you look in the middle plot, uh, in reality, an astrophysical source is, is often much more than a point source. So there's this complex wavefront coming in. And ideally you wanna take your telescope and you wanna scan your source. Uh, and for that, we actually use the rotation of the Earth. So that's Earth synthesis rotation. And you often need a, a long track in, a, in order for the telescope to slow and, and, uh, and scan your source. So in this way, you build up a data set of so-called visibilities. And then visibility is nothing more than an interferometer response for each antenna pair, each channel, uh, time interval, and, and polarization. And this is basically the Fourier transform of the, the sky brightness distribution basically your, your, your sky uh, model object. Um, and this is a complex function with, with amplitude and phase information. Uh, we don't need to go into the details of this in this talk. Uh, just keep in mind that, that amplitudes give you, give you the information on the source brightness. The phase information gives you information on the structure of the source. And you need now a software package to turn these visibilities into science products. Uh, two things still to be aware of. First of all, these visibility data sets can be very large. Uh, 100 gigabytes can easily be reached for a, for a typical VLA run, for example. Uh, another thing is that I mentioned before, we, we're not observing with a single telescope. We've broken up a telescope. So we're missing a lot of information. And the only way to, to get your model of the sky back is to iteratively reconstruct the model of the sky. And this is computationally very expensive, and it, it requires complex and advanced algorithms. So CASA is a software package that, that can do this. Um, CASA is built on top of CASA Core. Uh, CASA Core contains the original Apes++ libraries. Apes++ is kind of the predecessor to, to CASA. Uh, and this CASA Core uh, is a stable and nearly static platform. And CASA is built on top of this. And, and not only CASA, there's other radio astronomy packages build on top of, of CASA core. So CASA itself um, contains functionality in the form of tools, of tasks, of GUIs, and also an external data repository. So the CASA tools uh, are the basic C++ functions that perform basic operations on your data. Um, so if you're an expert user, you can just use the tools to reduce your data or even create pipelines and things like that. And more user-friendly are so-called CASA tasks. So CASA tasks are bundles of tools and Python functionality that perform a very in the data reduction. And I'll show you some examples of that uh, later in the talk. Uh, the GUIs, the graphical user interfaces, uh, we have as well to visualize and examine data. And then there's an external data repository with, with things like ephemeris data, B models, and, and, and values that, that may change from time to time. Uh, so this together is the CASA package, and it's very flexible and versatile, both for manual processing, uh, but also for scripting and, and pipelines. And in fact, we have several ALMA and VLA pipelines that we that, that, that are built on top of, of the CASA package. So this talk, I can't get into the details of how to reduce your data in, in CASA, uh, but I want to give you some examples of calibration, imaging, and, and also visualization, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, not so much about the process behind it, but really how you can use CASA to, to do your calibration and, and imaging. So let's start with, with calibration. So calibration is basically uh, you're trying to, to uh, transform your observed visibilities into the ideal visibilities that best represent your, 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 your object in the sky. 
And the thing is that you observe visibilities are corrupted by all kinds of corruption factors. And they range from, from atmospheric corruption factors down to corruption factors in your, in your hardware of the, of the instrument. And what you're doing in CASA is you create so-called calibration tables to take out each of these corruption factors. So if we have a look here, an example input data set, uh, the type of input data depends a bit on, on the order and, and the, the task that you, that you need to run. But you can see here in the middle column, the process column, you see several CASA tasks. So for example, you want to calibrate your bandpass, you use the task bandpass. You want to calibrate your gains or you want to scale your fluxes. Uh, when you do that in CASA, you get calibration tables and you can apply these calibration tables uh, using apply cal to eventually get your calibrated data out. Now, how you want to do this? Uh, let's take an, an, a look at the gain cal, for example. This is the task gain cal. So you open your CASA, um, you type gain cal, and between parentheses, you can put in all kinds of parameters. And you hit enter, and basically what, what happens is that gain cal is being run, and it gives you a calibration table. Um, those of you familiar with CASA may also see, uh, recognize this kind of input, the INP go method. So you type INP for gain cal, and you see the list of parameters that you can fill in on your screen. And here you see in blue the parameters that we changed from there, from the defaults. So if you hit go, again, gain cal is being run, and you get your calibration table that you, that you can use to correct your data. Now, once you have your calibrated data, you want to, of course, image this, either create 2D images or 3D data cubes. And for that, you need to apply a, a number of steps. You need to grid your data, you need to weigh your data, you need to apply a Fourier transform and potentially deconvolution and, and restoration. Uh, if you're not familiar with all these terms, um, I, I don't have time to go into this uh, in detail. Uh, what I want to point out is here that within CASA, we have one powerful imaging task that can do all this for you. So you do an INP on TCLEAN. TCLEAN is the name of the, the imaging task. And you see all these parameters that you can fill in. So you can fill in which critter you want to use, uh, what do you want to do, deconvolution, uh, primer beam correction, how you want to weigh your data. And you type go, and you basically get an output that is an, an image or an, an image cube. Now, once you have your image image cube, you want to have a look, of course. And, and people familiar with CASA will know the, the CASA viewer. The CASA viewer is a nice thing that you can just load your image and do some basic analysis on it. Um, the CASA viewer is getting old, though. And there's this fantastic new package called CARTA, the Cube Analysis Rendering Tool for Astronomy. Uh, this is not developed by the CASA team. This is an external package. Um, developed by Asia A in Taiwan, IDEA in South Africa, NREO, and University of Alberta. But this is really meant for the next generation radio telescopes. And this will eventually uh, replace the, the CASA viewer. And in fact, we, we really start encouraging CASA users to start using this, this package. Uh, it's a very nice software. Now, if you want to download and install CASA, you should uh, go to our website, casa.nreo.edu. And if you go to the download page, you see this, this overview here. Um, the latest CASA release is CASA 653. Uh, we aim to have a new release every two months, roughly. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that only some versions of CASA include pipelines. So the ELMA and the VLA pipeline are typically released once a year. So you need to be careful which version you download if you need pipelines. Um, now, the way you download the, the package and run it is very simple. You can just click on these links, you get a tar file, you unpack it, and you basically it's plug and play. You can just basically start CASA right away. And, and this tar file includes everything you need, libraries and, and also the Python environment. Now, as of CASA 6, something changed behind the, behind the hood. The, people normally won't see if they run the TAR files. Uh, and that is that CASA consists now underneath of pip wheels. So this allows the option for users to now also install CASA directly in their own Python environment. So this allows users to run CASA in a Pythonic way, and for example, on Jupyter Notebooks or on, on Google, Google Colab. So you see an example here of running CASA in the in Jupyter, Jupyter Notebook. 
Um, just yesterday, a user uh, pointed out a, a bug with Google Colab. Uh, apparently, they switched to Python 3.9, and we only support Python 3.8. So we're working working on that. But there's some work around of, of reverting back to, to 3.8 in, in Colab. Um, now, if you want to more know, know uh, if you want to know more about the the, the Casa code itself, uh, you should go to to Casa Docs, and this is our new Casa Docs on on GitHub, and basically it explains you all about the code. And the code is actually developed against this this documentation. Um, if you look in the bottom left corner, um, we actually release a version of Casa Docs with every Casa release as well. Uh, and there's a lot of information in, in Casa Docs. I'll show you just a few pages here. Um, we, for example, we have a release information page, but we also have a known issues list. So if you if you ever run into a problem with Casa, uh, I suggest have a look at, at here first. Uh, there's a list of, of known issues and some workaround solutions. Uh, that's the page on installation, both the, the DAF file and the, and the modeler installation. Uh, and we also have a new page on compatibility. So originally, um, CASA is really only officially supported for certain versions of Red Hat and Mac OS. Uh, but we know that users use different operating systems, uh, especially Ubuntu is used a lot. And also the latest Mac versions, we often have trouble to, to keep up with uh, with official support for those. Um, but we do believe that that uh, any OS you see in this table uh, should run CASA. And if that's not the case, then we'll treat it as a bug. So please contact us. Uh, the API section is important. Uh, for example, in the API section, you have information on CASA tools and CASA tasks. So let's go to a CASA task, for example, phase shift. Uh, you see this nice page with a description, with parameters uh, that are being explained, and with examples. And those of you familiar with CASA may 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 know that if you type the help command in CASA, you can get this information on your on your screen. Uh, we actually have a new command that I encourage users to use. That's a doc command. If you type doc face shift, basically your browser uh, opens a window with all this information on the on the screen. And then finally, in Casa Docs, we have some community examples. Um, and this is, for example, nice people that want to run Casa in a notebook environment uh, can have a look here. And there's some nice examples of, of how to do that. You have five minutes. OK, great. Thanks. So apart from the documentation, uh, the Casa team also published a new reference paper end of, uh, end of uh, last year. So this is in PASP. And it gives users a bit of high level overview of the CASA software. Uh, so we also encourage people that use the CASA software to, to use this as an official reference. Uh, in addition to this paper, in the same volume, there was a paper by the VLBI team on CASA uh, VLBI development. Now, the last few minutes of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about the future of, of CASA, in particular the future of radio astronomy, but specifically from a point of view of, of NREO and, and CASA. Um, there's two big things coming up that really uh, make us uh, think about data reduction, because the current CASA package will have trouble uh, keeping up with these uh, developments. Um, first thing is the next generation VLA. Uh, probably all of you have heard about this. This will be a, a continental uh, array in the US uh, operating in a frequency regime between SKA and, and ALMA. And it will have uh, more than 200 antennas uh, spread over the continental US uh, with a big uh, core in New Mexico around the place where the current VL VLA is uh, and with arms out to the current VLBA baselines. Uh, the data rates will be large for this kind of project. So we need a data reduction package then can keep up with uh, with this. Another big thing coming up is the ALMA wideband sensitivity upgrade. Uh, this will uh, basically be a, a new correlator for ALMA, uh, giving two to four times the current instantaneous bandwidth, uh, but with over a million channels. So the big thing here is that you won't have much trade-off anymore between your spectral resolution and your bandwidth coverage, but that you get everything in, in one go. And of course, this will also uh, vastly increase the data rates. 
So we need to keep up with that on the processing side as well. Uh, so the CASA team has started to look into a, a CASA next generation infrastructure, basically the middleware layers on which we then can build a new form of CASA. Okay, so this is really intended to to process demands of of NGVLA and also the wideband upgrade of of Alma. Uh, so this needs to be an efficient and easily scalable code and scalable to large computing environments. Uh, the current CASA code is quite complex, uh, and we need to reduce that uh, in order to also reduce development time and increase flexibility and and scalability. Uh, so the CASA team uh, made a start with this, and in 2021, we developed a prototype package that is actually open to, to users to have a look. Uh, keep in mind, this is not a package that you can use to reduce your data. It's really a, a prototype demonstration. And this was built in Python with, with off-the-shelf technologies uh, and natively, natively parallel. Um, this is all very much work in progress at NRAO and also in collaboration with other uh, divisions at NRAO. There's nothing set in stone about this particular demonstration package. Um, but it is nice to think about uh, how we are moving forward. And eventually we'll have a next generation CASA or even a completely different software package uh, built on top of this. Um, and actually, over the over the next years, there may be some some of this uh, CNGI middleware layers already used for for improvements on CASA, and, and users won't won't notice anything behind the scenes uh, until there eventually is is a new new package. Um, I don't have time to get into this uh, in more detail, and I'm also not the the, the I don't have the ex uh, the, the expertise to uh, to really dig into this, but it's a it's a nice development that's ongoing. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I want to leave you with some CASA resources. I told you about CASA docs, uh, the CASA website, CASA reference paper. Um, I also encourage everybody to subscribe for a few email lists uh, to get a CASA announcements and to get the CASA newsletter. Um, the ALMA and VLA instrument teams uh, also have some nice features like the CASA guides, which give you data reduction strategies. So if you need to start reducing your data in CASA, you can, you can have a look there. And they also run help desk if you're getting problems specifically with, with data reduction problems uh, concerning ALMA and VLA. And we actually hope to soon have a, also a CASA bug report system uh, within the help desk. And finally, if you, if you have any kind of feedback, uh, we would very much welcome you to, to contact us at casafeedback at nreo.edu. Um, any email you send there will be directly forwarded to the, to the CASA team. And I will see those, those emails. Uh, our CASA lead of Ashirao will see those emails and also Takeshi Nakazato, uh, which is the lead on the, on the single dish side. Uh, so this is all I wanted to tell you about CASA today, but I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much. That that was exactly perfect because the five minutes is over. So let's uh, have some applause for Bjorn and and then open uh, open the discussion up to questions about uh, either CASA or PROS or both. So, so one thing I do want to point out is that um, CASA has done a good job of, of listing how it wants to be cited. And this is a citation that is easy to find. As you can see, uh, the ASCL shows this um, right in its entry for CASA here. I think the ASCL is still on the old one. And there's no, it's like not. Blue. I just it's updated not. it. Oh, you oh, great. <laughs> so, and, and actually, <laughs> I would have I would have suggested that you um, use both because you already have so many citations to the other paper. My recommendation would be to ask for citations to both, but um, but yeah, I did change it because that's that's what you asked for. So yes, thanks. So that's something um, I saw. Michael had posted something about um, user growth for pros. And uh, that's something that I would encourage, uh, Lionel, I, I would encourage you to put your preferred citation information right on your GitHub repo and in your documentation as well. And let me know what it is so I can add it to the ASCL. <laughs> so, uh, because I know, I know journal editors do look at the ASCL to see what the preferred citation is. So we do try to keep that up to date. Okay, great. And encourage, 
encourage users to use the software tag in in WS journals too. Yes, yes. So so that's one of the things I really like when uh, when there's a software section listing at the end of the paper uh, they list all the software in addition to citing it in the bibliography because if it's not cited in the bibliography it's not going to count as a citation so so thank you um and michael will run questions so yeah. sorry i jumped in there but i, I no, have it's all good about citation um we 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 have another comment about user growth uh from uh evelina hopefully i'm saying that correct i'm not sure if they're still on or... yeah that's good yeah would you like to just tell your comment to everyone instead of me reading it um yeah sure um i was commenting on um user growth that you know the suggestions that you had were great um i would also add that you can include a contribution section either to your readme or a, a separate file in your github repo where you spell out how people can contribute and and making uh encouraging users to that uh low-level contributions are welcome that may draw in more um junior developers um also thinking about the credit model might be useful uh users are more likely to contribute if they get credit so thinking about you know astropy for example publishes a paper with every release and gives credit to the all the contributors that have done uh work on on the library so uh, thinking about how you may be giving credit in the future to new users might be useful yeah that those are excellent points just spelling out explicitly in your readme that you know contributors you know who who contributed x or whatever will be part of subsequent code papers or something like that just so they yeah. the expectation is clear that's a fantastic mm -hmm. suggestion thank you also um this is kind of like the end of the comment but um you should look into making your package astropy affiliated because astropy is a dependency of your package uh, that gives more publicity to your package and may also draw some of the contributors to from that community to contribute to your library as well um, they do have some requirements about you know tests and you know documentation etc that would also just make your library better uh, if you actually implemented them yeah you need to review that so it's a good idea Yeah, great suggestions. Uh, Thank you. John, there, there were, uh, there's comments about Python support. Python 3.8 runs out next year. Is CASA going to move to supporting more recent versions of Python? Uh, yes, we started a discussion yesterday, actually. Okay. <laughs> because, uh, like I mentioned, there was there was some reports that that Google already upgraded to three nine, so we run into trouble with installing Casa Pip wheels within GoLab. Right. Uh, so yes, we expect that to to be to move to three nine soon. Okay. But I cannot give you any definite uh, date on that. Okay. But look, definitely looking into it now. Yeah, the comment is that a lot of packages are dropping three eight support already. Yes. So NumPy. Yes. Yeah, things like that. Yep. So we need to we need to move this up to a newer version. Good, awesome. Yep. Um, do we have uh, um, Lionel asked some great questions of all of us? So we heard some nice suggestions, but these are good general questions for anyone who does software. Does anybody else have something to comment about tracking users, um, encouraging developers, and oh, I wrote down the last one, but I can't find it. Where did I write it down? Oh, oh and, and framework versus encouraging use of lower level packages. If anybody does, please unmute and uh, share your own experience in building up uh, developers. Maybe everyone's shy today. Um, Lana, how you you showed your development team? It was four, I think, four pictures i can't remember if there were like other names on there or so uh again an impressive amount of work for for this package this really seems uh cool say say you were to attract more developers do you have in mind some projects that that people might be able to start contributing on to you know both learn pros and also uh help out the package yep sure so we have um 
so currently we have different we have uh, projects uh, already with people uh, on these projects but for newcomers um, it's all about people that want to develop something they don't want to develop something from scratch um, but I, I I don't see any uh, like I was thinking any good first uh, contribution but um, yeah this is the kind of thing I I, I need to think about because right now the projects we have are, for example, developing PSF photometry. So that's, that mm -hmm. involves someone, uh, people working on uh, moving object detections that involves someone else. So it's always like this, uh, and it's good. It's good uh, that we have like students. They want to do an application. They see what's available. They want to do something from scratch. So they turn to pros because it's not completely from scratch. Uh, but I will definitely think about yes. uh, the kind of good first contributions, simple things that might be uh, available in prose. So I'm thinking about uh, radial profiles for galaxies. Um, so I think there is this, uh, I need to, to do this effort to go and propose that, for example, for, for students in uh, graduate uh, programs and so on. I see, yeah. Um, so, something you, you mentioned also triggered a memory for me as well. I started contributing to, to some packages by just uh, making fixes to the documentation. And yeah. that's an incredibly useful uh, contribution for, for the community. And also it's a way for people to get comfortable with just the whole workflow of contributing. So it's, it's another thing that you can try to encourage. Yeah, yeah. as, as you said, I, I think the, first, the real first step is to, uh, to go and put something really big in the, in the README to say yeah. uh, something about the contributions uh, yeah. so that people feel uh, welcome to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the CASA paper, which I posted the link to as well, that, that Bjorn said is, is, a, is a recent paper, uh, you also see that there um, a good number of authors are recognized for the contribution. So having that as a reward mechanism, you know, um, whether we like it or not, um, the citations papers there they they matter in our field yeah. yeah it's great insights yeah and Bjorn already answered the question I was asking about C++ uh, I just yeah sorry about that I just let no, 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 I was just yeah, curious to include that on the slide it's not pure as, as someone who's been moving all of our stuff that in that direction from from Portrait I was just curious about if there was a move away do we have other questions from the audience I, I can keep talking but there's lots of uh, wonderful people online. Um, both of you leverage other packages. So um, Lionel, you you mentioned AstroPy, you mentioned Fruit Utils. Uh, are there, I always like to hear about sort of the unsung hero packages. Are there packages that you rely on that maybe don't get the, um, the visibility that things like AstroPy, everyone in astronomy knows AstroPy, but maybe that you want to give a shout out to. Are there are there tools that you really rely on that more people should be aware of? Maybe not. I'm actually checking on my side, like the, yeah. the dependencies. Yeah. Um, well, in in general, um, yeah, I use Scikit uh, image a lot. Yeah. Uh, because of the transformations, I mean, it's mm -hmm. something on top. Of, I use on top of AstroPy, even if AstroPy has some capabilities. I would say I, I used to, it will be dropped in the exertions, but uh, X-arrays are great. Uh, they were great for people to be able to explore the data. And uh, Jupyter notebooks, I mean, yeah. I, it's yeah. always the, the best way for people to interact with uh, any Python instance. So yeah, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter notebooks, uh, big help, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and Bjorn, uh, same, same for you. Oh, maybe your FFT yeah. library, is that something you wrote yourself or is it something... Well, I think I think the main point to to point out is also Casa Core. Many people confuse Casa yeah. Core with with Casa, but there's okay. people behind Casa Core that support that, and also the data repositories. There's information we get from other institutes, astronomy, and places like that. So, we we rely on these kind of packages heavily, and uh, yeah, and of course the now with the Pipil version, the Jupyter notebooks, yeah. and, and and of course Python and C plus plus. So yeah, it's a big package. So there's a lot. Of I was impressed to hear to that I, I'm not an observer. I was impressed to hear that a, a VLA radio observation could be 100 gigabytes. That's that's a it's a good size. Yes. 
yeah. yes, a typical observing run can can be a, easily be a hundred gigabytes. So that that makes it uh, tricky to uh, to process yeah. if you don't have the right software. Indeed. Yeah. And this All is right. only the VLA. Because the next generation telescopes will be uh, will be even bigger. Big yeah. step. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, well. I think, uh, let's see, everyone who writes code, make sure that you're clear how you want your software cited. Alice is the expert on this. Listen to, to Alice. Uh, this, is, this is my plea um, that I run the, AS, the Astrophysics Source Code Library, and we've got over 3,000 codes, and more than half of them do not specify how the software should be cited. So there are numerous good ways to cite code in ways that are trackable by ADS and other indexers. Um, so please use a good method, put it, put information on how you want the code to be cited, where it can be easily found, and I'll thank you. And, and Evelina has a comment. Sorry, can I add to your public service announcement? I'm an yes. editor for JOS, so if you'd like to publish your code through JOS, please get in touch with me. Yes, absolutely. And that's true also for small pieces of code like your twirl library and other resources that you mentioned. That's a great reminder. Uh, Evelina, are, are you an editor, I take it then? Yes, I'm an editor. Great, fantastic. All right, folks, I think we're good on time. If there's no other questions, let's thank uh, both of our speakers, two excellent speakers. We will come back next month. Um, a uh, month after that, we're having a joint session with SciCode. So it'll, it'll all be about, you know, um, the software development process citations and, and, and such. And we have some other fun planned as well for over the summer. So uh, thank you, both of you. Yes, thank you very much. Applause to everybody. So, and, and I'm I'll... going to stop recording now. Yep. Great.